Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning on our webinar for expanding the TAP grant access tools for implementing SB 150. Um, we will get started here in just a second. Thank you again for joining us this morning. Okay, good morning, everyone. Again, thank you for joining us for our webinar this morning on expanding TP grant access tools for implementing SB 150. I'm very excited to have everyone here. Um, going to so just um, some information for um, our participants here. Again, thank you for joining us this morning. If you would like to call in to listen to this webinar, the, the number is here on the screen, um, and there's an ac special access code in order to um, to uh, access the webinar. Uh, the presentation materials are actually inside of your participant panel, which can be downloaded in the handout section. Um, you actually have a already have a copy of the SD150 toolkit that's hot off the press that we just published. Um, so you can download that now on our website, which I will explain later on in the presentation, and also in the handout section that is in your participant panel. You also have a copy of this presentation as well. Um, and these materials will also be emailed to you um, as a follow-up, as well as provided on our website once we have um, uploaded our these materials to the website and sent to you as a follow-up email. Um, so you can always go back and re-watch um, the materials and watch the presentation. And then uh, we will be doing a live Q&A at the end of the session. So you can submit questions actually throughout the presentation um, into that questions panel, type in your question and then click send once you, um, uh, you're happy with their question, send it over and we will be answering questions at the end. So during for today's presentation, we're gonna go through three main things. We're gonna talk about the new TFE TV provisions or TFE grant provisions. We're gonna give, I'm going to give some implementation recommendations. Um, we're gonna hear from a college that has already implemented it and has some really great processes and tools that they're already using. Um, and then I'm going to be sharing some tools for campuses who um, are in various stages of implementing these policies. So I have some forms that we're gonna go through that um, are also available for download that are also located in the toolkit, which again is in the handout section um, that you can use as you are um, implementing SB 150. So again, I again um, welcome you. Thank you for joining us this morning. Hope everyone is um, healthy and safe at home. So today's panelist is myself, I'm Tia. Uh, Tia Holiday. I am the program manager, the education program manager here at John Burton Advocates for Youth. You're going to hear from um, CSAC, the California Student Aid Commission. Um, Santiago Morales has um, graciously volunteered to be with us this morning to give us some Chafee Grant updates as well as talk about a new COVID-19 resource. Um, and then you have Brittany Slate who is from Sierra College and she will be um, discussing their processes that how, and how they are implementing SB 150. And so before I go on to the new provisions, I want to just give a very high level overview and a reminder for maybe those that are maybe a little unfamiliar with the Chafee Grant. So the Chafee Grant is the only source of financial aid that is specifically designed for foster youth. Uh, okay, so the, while there are a, a slew of state and federal financial aid, the Chafee Grant is designed specifically for foster youth to attend college or career and technical training. Uh, they are eligible once they um, hit their on or after the 16th birthday, um, and they can receive it up until July 1st of their 26th birthday, which is exciting. Uh, there is approximately, they are eligible for up to $5,000 per academic year. And um, as with the passage of SB 12, um, there's now an automatic data match with the Department of Social Services that will match the um, student's foster care status to the um, CSAC or the California Student Aid Commission's database. So the hope is that there are less barriers for students to verify their Chafee grant or their, Chafee, uh, sorry, their foster use status. Um, I will note that 
Um, it, I, if there's some, for some reason there's a match, there isn't a match um, for the students that they will need to provide, they may have to provide some verification to the financial aid office. Um, and so just making sure that students, if you're working with students and you're working with foster youth, especially that they have access and they know how to get their um, Chafee or their um, foster youth verification. They can also call the ombudsman's office, um, which I will provide that phone number in the follow-up email. Um, they can also provide um, verification letters as well. Okay, so I'm actually gonna turn it over to Santiago, who is from the California Student Aid Commission. He's gonna provide us with some updates on a really awesome COVID-19 resource um, and just some updates on the TAFI grant as it stands today. And if you're talking, Santiago, I can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Hello? Yes, you are good. Okay, I apologize, thank you, Tia. Um, so when you go to our CSAC website, uh, csac.ca.gov, um, there's a pop-up that comes up right away that says for more information regarding CSAC's response to COVID-19, click here. That actually takes you to a, um, a great resource page. Uh, it starts off with a message from our executive director, uh, Marlene Garcia and it has great links to frequently asked questions um, by students, um, by schools, um, resources for undocumented uh, students and dreamers, um, and also links to our foster youth uh, resources page that we also have there and general resources. Um, it goes over what our response is to um, the COVID-19 and this is constantly being updated so there may be new updates. So I always encourage students to go check it out. Um, it has recent webinars. Uh, state and federal updates, um, health-related resources. So we tried to add as much uh, resource information as we could. And you know, as things change, we're going to keep updating this. Uh, for just foster youth, uh, we do have that under. Um, you can link to it from this main page on the TSAC uh, uh, front page uh, for our response. But you can also go to it by clicking for students, um, and that's in the PowerPoint right now. And then from there, it takes you to all the um, it takes you to the uh, page for uh, foster youth uh, resource, and that has uh, information that links to uh, the John Burton Advocates for Youth, also Department of Social Services, and it also will go over uh, CalCRAN B foster youth information on how to apply and um, how to contact us about that, and of course the Chafee Foster Youth Grant Program. Um, that leads to our our Chafee website as well, where we have more information on where we pay for college and other resources for foster youth and getting more financial aid. So all that's there as well as, as, for, as, well as more uh, frequently asked questions. And actually, and we, we recently updated um, our website. So we have a fresh new looking website where it's easier for students to find information. Uh, for students that want to apply, there's a box down there to start your Chafee application. We, um, we're updating this website as well to have make sure that we um, put any any necessary updates or any changes to any um, regulations on here as well, so that they'll be able to find this here. Um, if they need to, if their foster care eligibility form is missing, uh, they can go to Chafee Eligibility. There's actually a drop-down box that um, will allow them to download the form and also link to the ILP coordinators um, that certify the form and then send that form to us. So they would find that information here. We always encourage um, students to, once they complete their Chafee application or even before, they can go and complete their uh, Web Grants for Students account. That way they can check their status and see if they're actually missing um, that CDSS uh, foster youth verification. Um, some important updates. Uh, we still have about 784 students that are not meeting SAP. Um, at the beginning of the year, we were about 820. So that's gone down a little bit. Uh, but we still have a lot of students that are currently uh, not awarded um, because they're not meeting SAP, even after SB 150 came into effect. We have over, um, we have about 89 awards that are sitting out there with the schools that are ready to be certified. Last week we had over 100, only 16 got certified last week. Um, so that's a pretty low amount. I make calls uh, to as many schools as I can and to financial aid officers and uh, financial aid directors advising that they need to 
request funds for these students. These are students that are already awarded and waiting to be certified and requested the funds. So, um, you know, we I really appreciate your help for any financial aid officers that are out there listening to uh, make sure that you work your payment roster. If you have any questions, give us a call at Chafee Team or email us. We could help you out. We still have about 1,490 students that are waiting to be awarded. These are students that are all fully certified, have a need, and are waiting to be awarded. So one of the biggest challenges that we have is making sure that you work your payment roster, award the students that can be awarded. If not, please mark them ineligible so that we can award the next student that's waiting. And also very important is to send back the warrants that you have in your office. Um, I keep receiving warrants from last September, October, November. Um, that money that you send back to us because the student's not eligible or not enrolled, that helps get recycled back so we can award more students. So we still have about $865,000 left to pay. That means that's about, um, uh, the, that's funds that are left to pay that is still sitting with this in the school's hands. So this is money that's already been awarded out. It's there waiting. It's part of the 89 awards that are waiting that are uncertified and also part of the summer term. So this money is out there waiting to be, um, it's already awarded um, and it's already sitting with the schools that need to take action um, either today or when they can after uh, May 18th when we open up the summer term to request those funds. Uh, so those are the quick updates uh, for now. And then if you guys have any questions, be more than happy to answer them uh, towards the end. Great, thank you so much, Santiago. I appreciate all those updates, um, as I'm sure that our attendees do as well. Um, and again, as Santiago just mentioned, that he will be sticking around until the end. So if you have questions, um, please make sure to put them in that questions box that's located within the participants panel. All right, so we're gonna move forward here. So there are um, approximately five new provisions that um, are um, that are new for SB 150. And so we are going to do a very high level overview right now of those provisions. And then I am going to walk through each provision um, and provide some context for those provisions, including some implementation recommendations for some of them. And some of them, we even have some sample templates that um, we have created and which again is going to be located within the toolkit uh, that we are going to go through. So Let's go ahead and get started. So the first revision is related for CSAC. This is um, over awarding the TP grants to ensure that FOSTUs are receiving their payments in a timely manner. Um, this provision is still being reviewed and um, implemented by uh, CSAC. Um, and so we're not gonna go through a bunch of detail on that one today um, because it's really not related to um, institutions quite yet, um, but um, we just know that that provision um, is on the book. Uh, provision two, this is where we're getting into um, where institutions need to start updating their policies and procedures if they haven't already. Um, and if you're working with foster youth um, that maybe they uh, that um, have not made SAP uh, student satisfactory academic progress, this may also be um, a way to check in with your students to see if they're aware of these updates as well. Um, and so the first provi second provision is going to require colleges to make sure that students are aware of the available resources that are on campus. Um, and so that's creating a resource flyer um, that students are going to be distributed and within that first time that they receive a Chafee check. And again, we'll discuss more of that later on in the presentation. The third provision is going to be um, related to satisfactory academic progress. So students that aren't making SAP or satisfactory academic progress for two years um, can continue to receive the Chafee grant as long as they are create, oh, excuse me, I'm back up. Um, students have to create a plan within the first year of not making staff um, in order to continue to receive that grant for up to two years. They need to continue, they need to either create that plan or to update a plan. The next revision is um, about students that are returning. Um, maybe they had left, they had left this institution due to not making, uh, they were disqualified from financial aid. And when they return to this campus and to the institution, um, they are automatically um, re-eligible for the Chafee grant. And then the last provision is related to some new um, Chafee appeal processes that um, we will talk about more in detail, but there are some new criteria for students to appeal um, their Chafee grant if they don't make it within those two years.
So the next provisions are related to satisfactory academic progress or again, SAP. Um, before we go into specifics on this provision, I wanna provide just a little bit of background of what SAP is um, and how foster youth are faring. So SAP is a standard um, for receiving financial aid in order to meet and to continue to keep their federal and state financial aid. Um, there's generally three items that make up SAP. The first is going to be a GPA requirement. This requirement is set by the individual institutions, but the federal guidelines note that GPA should not be lower than a 2.0 after the first two years. A second is related to PACE. The so PACE is the rate of students completing um, their courses in a given semester. So typically students need to meet 67% um, of their credits attempted in a given semester. And then the third is related to time frame. So this is the time frame that students are completing their degree um, and their degree goal. So students have to complete their degree within 150% of the credit hours for their um, for their required program. Now the reason that SB 150 came about is really because of this um, that I have on the screen here is that foster youth are significantly more likely to not make SAP. Um, and so we're gonna talk, look at a little bit of data here to see, um, to back that statement up. So data that was provided by the Educational Results Partnership revealed that foster youth are not making SAP um, at significantly higher rates than non-foster youth. Um, as you can see, foster youth are having an incredibly difficult time in their first term of college. Um, and this is why I'm sure many of you that are working with foster youth directly um, understand why. Um, there's a lot of things that are involved with navigating the college system and navigating and understanding SAP is one of them. Um, and so again, you know, I wanted to emphasize that SAP requirements are confusing. There's a lot of um, educational jargon that is associated with it. And so students that are learning how to, trans um, to transition into the college are having a difficult time understanding these processes. Um, they don't understand that when you drop a class that can significantly impact your financial aid. They're taking longer to develop their study skills. Um, they have a lack of stable um, adult support to help them navigate these systems. Um, and so foster youth are coming into college at a significant disadvantage than their non-foster youth counterparts. And so this really led to um, some of these provisions. Okay, so the second provision um, is that before, uh, is that students receiving a TAFE grant for four semesters or five quarters before losing their grant um, can continue to receive it as after um, not making SAP for one year now, or continue to receive it for up to two years, excuse me. So before SB 150, failure to meet SAP for up to one year resulted in not um, being ineligible for financial aid. Um, and then for some colleges had appeal processes and there was a process in order to get that financial aid back. Um, that included the TAFE grant. So the new requirement is now that when students um, aren't making SAP for up to two years, then um, for their TAFE grant, that is, that they are then eligible to um, uh, appeal the process. Um, and again, we're gonna talk about the appeal. So they are able to keep their TAFE grant for a, a year longer, even when they are losing their actual, the rest of their state and federal financial aid. And I wanna emphasize that these new rules are only applicable to the TAFE grant. It is not applicable to other state and um, sources of state and federal financial aid. And so the new provisions also require a new support and referral requirement. So as far as support, when students are receiving their first payment of their TAFE grant, um, they need to be including, institutions need to be including uh, information about support services and how to complete an educational plan. Um, as we had noted in a couple of slides before is that students have difficult times navigating these processes. They may not be aware, especially the first time they're receiving a TAFE grant, of all of the slew of um, support services that are available for them on that campus. Um, and so they maybe are only aware of the foster youth program, but they don't know there's a basic needs center. Um, there's someone to maybe navigate um, tutoring. Okay, so they need to be aware of these things so that they are set up for success um, when they first receive their payments. And then if students have not already completed an educational plan, um, they need to have some clear steps on how to complete an educational plan. Um, so they are actually on track to graduate. Second requirement is um, for after one year of not making SAB or satisfactory academic progress, um, students then will be meeting with a team member on or staff member on that campus to create or update um, a success plan. Now, a success plan does look different than an educational plan or can look different. 
students may need help um, with that process. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about what that looks like in a second. So who can create this plan? Again, I just had mentioned that this plan looks a little bit different than maybe creating a traditional educational plan. Um, that you know, an educational plans are really documenting which classes the students need to take and when. So the plan can be created by a FOSU liaison, EOPS counselors, um, disability student counselors, um, the uh, next up counselor, FOSU program members, um, and then really someone who the institution has institute um, has designated to, to support the student to create a plan. And I want to emphasize here that the plan doesn't have to be with an academic counselor. Um, academic counselors um, may not have the capacity, for example, to um, have this kind of robust planning with the student on top of making sure that they have the classes that they need um, for their educational plan. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about what the implementation looks like for this actual plan. It sounds great in theory, but what does it look like in practice? Um, and so when institutions are um, implementing this, the first provision as far as providing a flyer, for example, um, for students of the student services that are available on campus, they need to make sure that the flyer is easy to read and that it's easy to navigate, um, that students can easily pick this up and see this is where I need to go, this is who I need to speak with, this is um, who I need to email in order to receive this. Um, and so making sure that it's easy to follow and easy to flow um, on within that flyer. You need to make sure that you're including this relevant support services. And in the, ne uh, in the next slide, I'm gonna show kind of an example of what those um, support services can look like, um, but not only including the FOSU support programs, but including um, additional relevant programs that the student may need to be successful. Um, this is especially important, uh, you know, and I, my background is actually working at colleges um, and, you know, and seeing that a lot of times information just isn't updated. And so there may be a flyer that's already created um, that institutions are using, but they need to make sure that they're updating the contact information um, semesterly. They need to make sure that, you know, people move around, people are promoted, um, maybe departments are actually completely gone, depending on um, you know, funding availability for particular programs. And so just making sure that the um, information is regularly updated on those flyers is critical. Um, you don't wanna get a student's hopes up that there's a program, they go to that program and it's gone. Um, and so that, that can really be detrimental for the student um, as you know, now we have, you have provided a support service that doesn't actually exist. Um, and then also making sure that um, when you are, if you are providing this, when you're providing this flyer, it is provided in a paper and an electronic form, and it's easy to navigate to get to that form. Um, and again, once you're updating those forms, you're updating the website. Um, I can't tell you how many times I had students that would come into my office when I was working at colleges um, that would be frustrated they can't find the document on the, on the website because the website either was up, wasn't updated or there was an old flyer than the one that they um, physically had on paper before. And so just being mindful that um, the, all the items, all of these items need to be regularly updated and to provide it in multiple forms. And so within the toolkit, I actually have, we have created a, um, some, a sample of what this can look like. Um, I have talked to many institutions already that have um, something already slightly created um, or they're modifying something. And I've talked to institutions that don't have anything created yet. Uh, and so there's some, a few samples that we have provided for a lot of these things that we're about to talk about. Um, and we have actually provided a sample support services flyer. So on each of our examples um, on our sample flyers, we're gonna provide you with some instructions on how to use that template. Um, and then, so as you see here, we had earlier had mentioned that make sure you're including relevant student support services that are on that flyer. And so we have provided some examples of what that can look like. So if you are providing um, academic counseling, making sure that if you have a laptop program, that's going to support the student, obviously, to be successful in their classes. Um, if there's major specific mentoring programs, um, you're making sure that that's on that flyer. Um, student support resources, of course, making sure that students know if you have a LGBTQI center or a multicultural center um, or for a parenting students program. So making sure that there's all these relevant, really great programs that are on campus um, that are in one centrally located spot. My second page um, is really just a template that um, institutions can use to just copy and paste into their programs. Again, um, this template is actually going to, is, is currently available on the website. It's available as a Word doc and it's available within the actual 
um, toolkit as a PDF. So uh, institutions can take this document and use it as they like. Um, and you know, we're hoping that this would provide a little bit of ease as they're implementing these new provisions. And so we now have the referral support um, referral person. So who we have already discussed who can actually provide um, or who can do the actual plan, the support plan, um, or the plan for success with the students. Um, when the when you are creating these plans, though, you need to make sure that you are addressing both um, the academic and the socio-emotional obstacles of students not making SAP or satisfactory academic progress. Um, as we know, with foster youth, there are um, tons of things that are happening in their lives that are maybe outside of their control, or maybe it is within their control. However, uh, maybe this is the first time that they're having to sit down and to identify and to think about and think through um, why they're not um, why they're not being successful in their courses. Okay, so making sure that um, staff members have a capacity for that. You know, that it may not, be, it likely cannot be done in a 30-minute appointment. It may need to be an hour or an hour and a half appointment. And so if we're having general counseling, for example, to be um, the individuals that they can do these plans with, making sure that general counseling um, is aware of the capacity and the needs that they may need to do um, with these students. And if they are, if you are providing um, identifying staff other than maybe the faculty support program or an FYSI or an EOPS, uh, make sure to provide some training. Um, I already mentioned uh, general general counseling, um, but providing training in mental health first aid, um, basics and understanding, you know, foster youth circumstances. There's a lot of very specific things that foster youth go through that are very different than the general population of students. And so if you are providing a service and are referring students to go to places other than a foster support program or an next up program, uh, making sure that you're providing training for those staff so they know how to have these conversations and maybe some of the circumstances that these youth may be going through. And then um, the last one is um, ensuring that the student has privacy. There's, I'm gonna be showing a flyer here that's going to reveal some, you know, it could reveal some very, um, private information about the student. Um, and so if we're talking about the socio-emotional obstacles the students are going through, they can reveal some things in those meetings and those conversations that shouldn't be shared with um, other individuals on campus. And youth should feel safe in order to share those things and understand that if I share these in, um, this information with this individual, other people aren't going to see it. Um, there's make sure that you are um, being trauma informed and also that um, again, you're just ensuring the student's privacy. And so we do have a sample of these, um, what a student success plan can look like. Um, this is a really long sample. Again, we have these um, forms so that you can take with them and use them um, as you like as, the, as an institution. So again, on that first page, we just have instructions on how to use the template. And the second page is really the start of what the template looks like. So I mentioned earlier to make sure that in instructions are easy and clear to read. Um, on that first page of really any form that we're providing to students, um, making sure that they know the clear directions, who can help them um, with, the, with whatever this form is. In this case, it's who, what program or individuals can help them complete this document. Um, and then a time frame of with that they need to have the document in and where to actually turn it in. So the next page is actually the most more robust pieces of this um, document. This is going to be the students are identifying the obstacles. So they're sitting down with an academic um, or a staff member or faculty or staff member, and they are thinking through and having a really reflective conversation about the obstacles that they are facing as they are trying to make satisfactory academic progress. Um, I have to admit that a lot of these forms actually come from my own experience and talking to a lot of other campuses of um, really having to sit down and have meaningful conversations. Um, and so there's really four categories, an academic, personal and financial, um, their major and career, and then family and social adjustment. And, you know, and I do encourage, we stay on here to say, um, to list three things. Um, if the institution feels that there shouldn't be a number on there, um, you know, but uh, that's great. Um, I do think that in, when you have students that are really thinking through the main obstacles um, and to narrow it down to three to five, um, it really forces them to have to have these really difficult conversations sometimes within themselves of why am I not being successful and what do I need? 
And so in turn, they would then take this, those obstacles um, and then start to, again, have that really reflective conversation and, converse, um, and discussion with whoever their staff member um, or faculty member is on that campus. Um, and so this, is, this exercise is making them write down what that obstacle is, um, then to identify what obstacles, um, what, how to overcome that obstacle, and maybe some potential challenges along the way and strategies that they can use. Um, so I, I keep emphasizing this, but this is a reflective exercise that can't necessarily be done um, you know, in a 30 minute span. Okay, So making sure that there's time and that students are aware of how much time they have. Um, they may be able to engage in an even more robust conversation if they, if you start the conversation with, you have an hour and a half for this conversation, as opposed to, we have 30 minutes, let's get in and out. We don't, well, that's not trauma informed. We wanna make sure that students feel safe um, and that they um, have time to um, create this plan. And so in the next form, um, this is really, this three pieces on this form. This one, the first one is about class attendance. So students that, um, you know, again, this is coming from my own experience of working on campuses. Uh, I had students that were, were having some academic problems. They weren't making satisfactory academic progress. Um, we find out later within the semester that um, they weren't coming to class on time. Um, and it was really due to the relationships that we had built with faculty members on campus. Um, but this exercise is really putting the reflection piece back on the students. Um, are they attending class? Are they attending the full class? Um, this may be where you find out, well, they may be attending class, but they're skipping halfway through. Or maybe they are within a math class and we're finding out, oh, they actually have some difficulties staying in the class and they're getting frustrated because they don't understand the material. Um, and so again, this is having students to identify um, some potential um, struggles and provides a staff member to, um, some time and some space to talk through these struggles and why they're not coming to class. The next piece is making the student to identify those campus resources. So at this point in the, um, in the process, the student is, hasn't made that for at least a year. They received that flyer um, in that first time that they received a TAKI check. So now this is a chance to go back to that initial flyer um, and have students look at this flyer and look at the resources that they um, could potentially use on campus that can help them get through these obstacles. And then the next one is checking in on their progress. You know, FOSTUs, again, I had mentioned before, and if you are, if you are working directly with FOSTUs, you understand this, and that there isn't necessarily a, um, a stable um, adult supporter that is behind them all the time, right? And so making sure that there's someone um, in a time frame that they can check in with someone about their progress towards this plan. They identified three strategies. Is the student actually following the strategies? Did the strategy not work? This can provide a, um, an opportunity to revise those strategies and to have another robust conversation with the student. Um, and then, so the student actually feels successful and um, self-efficacious to actually move forward in this process and to be successful. The ultimate goal is for the student to make satisfactory academic progress so that they can graduate and hopefully to transfer or go on to whatever career goals that they have. And then this last page, um, I had mentioned earlier that there was, we wanna make sure that we're ensuring student success um, and student privacy, excuse me. And then this last page is really um, speaking to that. The last page is about um, providing one page, a one page document that notes, yes, the student met with me as a staff or faculty member. Um, yes, the student completed the plan. Please reinstate their TAP check um, and release their funds. Um, and so this would be the document or that is either emailed or um, provided to the staff member. Um, and, you know, I encourage to the staff member to actually provide this directly to financial aid, but also give students agency and that um, provide them with this document if for some reason they the staff member can't get it to financial aid or they need to student needs to give it to financial aid directly. And again, this document can be downloaded on our website, which I'll share here soon. Um, and it's also located as a PDF within the toolkit. The next provision is related to students which, um, students regaining eligibility once they return to the institution. So during the old process, this is prior to SB 150, um, students that were disqualified due to SAP um, are returning to the campus and re-enrolling. Um, they have to demonstrate for at least one term that they um, can be successful. And at that point, then they will be 
um, reinstated their um, Chasey check and their financial aid. The new process is that when a student returns back to school after um, uh, one full academic semester or um, two quarters, um, then they're immediately reinstated um, and to have their Chasey check. So, um, you know, we have a couple policy recommendations or implementation recommendations on this one. Um, but if you're at an institution, you're at a financial aid office, especially, and you haven't actually ran um, a check to make sure that students who are do fit into this category, um, please make sure that you're running reports to make sure that students are receiving their funds if they are re-enrolling after being disenrolled for at least one academic semester or two um, academic quarters. Um, as Santiago had mentioned, there's funds that are still available um, and there are, there are students waiting. Um, and so if we can get those students to get the Chafee checks, um, that would be wonderful. Um, I do also want to um, emphasize that making sure that we train our student services staff on this is also important. Okay, so there's a lot of um, financial aid rules that maybe our general counseling or our staff members are aware of. But now that we have some new rules, especially for Chafee, we want to make sure that we're training our staff, especially for this provision, because um, this could be a deciding factor of students coming to back to school or not. Maybe they needed to take a break to go to handle some life things. And now if they know that they're coming back and they're able to reinstate their Chafee check immediately, um, they may be more likely to come back um, to continue on towards their goals. So the next, the next provision is about um, new criteria about appealing the loss of Chafee grant. So there's three new provisions that are within this new law. The first one is that the student, um, uh, this, and this would actually be activated, so to speak, after the student hasn't made SAP for two, um, for two years. Okay, so the student has made the plan uh, that first year they have updated their plan, maybe they didn't make, continue to not make SAP, they updated that plan with a staff member, and now we're at two years and the student has not um, made SAP, or student academic, satisfactory academic progress. So now there are um, three ways that the student can actually appeal that. First one is that the student demonstrates that they have a cumulative um, 2.0 GPA or have pro um, provided some proof within the last um, semester, previous term that they have achieved a 2.0. The next one is about extenuating circumstances. Um, so the student had an extenuating circumstance that they have since um, they have since addressed, um, and they are providing some kind of proof that they have addressed that. And then the next one is um, that the student is engaged, already engaged in some kind of support program. So this could be a next up program. Um, maybe they're involved in a um, in their um, transitional housing program, and there's a really great. Um, there's a program happening there. So they're engaged in a program that is already aware, likely, that they are having some academic difficulties and are committed to helping that student get back on track. So some implementation recommendations um, on this one is, again, making sure that there's clear instructions on how these students can get assistance, um, especially when they are trying, they are di differentiating these three new criteria. This is new for everyone, this is new for students, and it's new for institutions. Um, so making sure that students are clear on the instructions on how to do it and where to get that, um, get that assistance. Um, this process really should be about eliminating obstacles. Um, we have tons of suggestions on how to eliminate obstacles within our toolkit, um, but just some examples to be um, you know, making sure that there's students can complete the form if there there is a you know a, an appeal form that is associated with this um, criteria, um, that there isn't a need for a wet signature, that there is a process for electronic signatures. You know, students may have transportation issues. Um, I'm especially thinking of students that are in more rural areas where transportation is sparse if at all. Um, and so, you know, this could be an obstacle of getting a timely um, payout for their Chafee check if they have to come to campus, have a wet signature and you know, do all these processes. I think with COVID-19, um, you know, it's really flipped the script um, and you know, put things on their head of providing um, services for students remotely. So thinking about those things as we, when we do actually return to campuses of what obstacles can actually be eliminated when we are implementing these new appeal processes. Um, making sure to provide templates and examples. Um, you know, I think that students, when they are completing these processes, it can be overwhelming, um, you know, and for some students, just, and this is coming from experience of working with students, it can be embarrassing. 
Um, they're not sure how to actually frame um, their obstacles. They're not sure how to um, write about, um, you know, these personal things that have happened to them. Um, and, you know, some of them may just not do it because they're overwhelmed and they've never had to do it. And so making sure to provide some examples and some templates on um, here's what needs to be in your statement, for example, here are some examples of what can be in your statement um, can be really helpful for students to be successful. Um, and then also just making sure that there's um, the, all the forms that are um, provided online, um, that they're accessible for um, students with disabilities, um, that they're fillable, for example, that they are able to be read by screen readers. Um, and so just making sure that we do an accessibility check um, when we're placing things online. Um, and if we're not sure how to do that, I highly suggest um, campuses to connect with their um, disability Resource Center and just do, making sure that they're doing a double check on, um, you know, is this form accessible for my for students with disabilities. And so we do have a sample form within the toolkit of what a TAPI appeal can look like. Um, again, on that first um, first half is going to be just some instructions. Um, there's three sections that um, are complement to each provision. Section one is, of course, you know, verifying that they have that GPA um, and it's to attach um, documentation. So they may, you, maybe the institution is requiring that they um, attach maybe an unofficial transcript. Um, you know, again, when it's talking about eliminating um, barriers, if this process can be done automatically, that would be wonderful. Um, you know, campuses obviously have access to see their academic records. And if they're seeing that they had met at least a 2.0, then there may be not even need to be a need to do this form. Um, but if they are requiring the form um, to have students to um, attach documentation may be required. Um, section two is about um, participating in a student services program. So the student indicates that they, um, if they are, then they will indicate yes. Um, and then to indicate which program and to have the student sign it, provide a phone number just in case financially needs to follow up. Um, I do want to emphasize too that um, making sure the students know that they only need to complete one of the sections. Students do not have to do, have, they don't have to meet all three criteria. They only need to meet one of the criteria in order to be able to appeal. And then that last one is going to be related to the um, extenuating circumstances. So um, providing um, documentation and a space for students to um, provide that narrative. And again, um, this is where students may need to have an example or a template of how to complete this document. We just reviewed um, a, a lot, we just reviewed a ton. So there's two ways that you can access the templates and the implementation recommendations that I just went through. Um, we have our toolkit, which is available online, um, and you also have it within your handouts. And we also have a website that we, um, where you can um, grab the toolkit, you can share the toolkit with your colleagues, um, and we also have all three of these um, templates that are available on our website. Um, currently, they are live um, that are in a Word document form. So you can easily um, move things around and to download it to um, the institution's liking. Okay, and at this point, I'm actually going to hand it over to Brittany, who is from Sierra College, and she's going to talk a little bit about um, how they have implemented these provisions um, and um, show us some really great resources that they have created. Hi, everyone. Um, I am going to go over some of the policies that we have implemented at Sierra College as a result of SB 150. And um, a lot of the things that we'll go over um, were actually recommendations from um, John Burton's organization, and that was wonderful to have that communication. So you guys will see that reflected in these um, in the next couple slides. So um, first, we'll go over the new policies at Sierra College. And um, one of the biggest things that we thought would help our students was if all of the foster youth petitions and appeals went through the employee that was already responsible for the Chafee eligibility. And so there's sometimes that SAP appeals and petitions go through one person and then the other person in the office is responsible for verification and then the other person in the office is responsible for Chafee eligibility. And so instead of having three different people have to touch that student's file or that student's information, all of those things now go through one employee. Um, and at 
our college, that is myself. Um, I sit in a very unique position at Sierra College being the next up financial aid technician. And so I'm a piece of the next step program and also a piece of financial aid. So it gives me a very um, ideal situation at the college to be able to see what the student is really tapping into as far as their resources. And so it was a natural um, responsibility for me to take on. Um, in order to help our um, our other student services, because while I'll, I'll be the one doing the petitions and appeals, everyone needs to be able to understand this, the process so they can help our students. And so we created a flow, which we'll, um, I'll show you guys in just a few moments, just to kind of help our staff and our students, really, I made it for both, to be able to see where they fall into this flow of the new policies that SB 150 gave us. And so that was a big piece of um, our training process for our staff, our financial aid staff, our next step staff, the counselors in general counseling, really anyone who's helping our students with this process. Um, and so we'll go over that flow in just a little bit. We did also all, um, also create a Chafee reinstatement petition. And this petition, um, we call a reinstatement petition when they are not meeting SAP. Um, and we created this to be used in the case that the student was denied any other financial aid, but still needed to have the conversation with a staff member. Our idea for this petition was that it would be done with a staff member present, so we can have you know, some really good conversations with our students um, to help them be successful. And so um, we, we see this form being used kind of later on in the process of, of, um, of their appeal. Um, we also created new communications to our students with the resources on campus that are available to them. And um, as was suggested earlier, to have that in print and by um, email, we, we are doing both. So when the student receives their, um, their check, they receive the printed copy. When they receive their email, letting them know that their check is available for pickup. Um, and that was pre-COVID-19, um, they would come and pick it up from the financial aid office. Um, they would get another um, shot at seeing it. So that has been extremely helpful in our communication to our students. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So one of the, the first things that we um, kind of hit while we were making these new procedures is that at a campus level, this is a new satisfactory academic progress that is different than any federal or state regulations that we have to abide by. And so that's really what drew us to having one person in the office take on the petition because if we can use the same petition that they can use for their federal and state aid and use that also for Chafee, that the person that is responsible for the new SB 150 regulations can just go through all of it all at one time. It did require that I go through a little bit more training um, for our SAP process with our um, one of our specialists, but we decided that that was needed. Um, we have about 150 to 200 foster youth on campus, not all are Chafee eligible, and so taking on that that SAP process for all foster youth was not a big lift when we're talking about, you know, we have 15,000 students on campus. So um, that's kind of where we found that solution to be is that, you know, one person would be responsible for all the foster youth documentation for their appeals. Um, and if we go to the next slide, you can see that, that reinstatement petition. It's very clean, very simple, and it, it's um, also fillable. So if the student does need to see someone, especially in this environment that we're in now, to where we can't sit down with a student and having a conversation over the phone is a little bit tough. We can even make this a fillable document and um, Zoom with our students to be able to fill it out with them um, and really have those intentional conversations about what's going to make them successful and help them really see what they have in their, in their own toolkit um, to be successful. So um, it's been very helpful to kind of guide conversations with our students that are um, that are needing to fill out this this petition. So um, our our biggest uh, goal with these any of our new forms was to make it extremely clean, 
very simple and, um, and really drive a conversation instead of just being another form that the student has to fill out. So that was our idea. Um, on the next slide, we have our um, flow that we used to train our counselors and our staff that are working with our foster youth, and really so that they could follow the students' academic progress and kind of help them land where their next steps would be. A lot of our, our staff and, and counselors actually just refer the student back to me in the Next Step office, which is fine because that helps them get connected with even more resources beyond just their financial aid. Then they're connected with our program, which is connected with tutoring and even more support. Um, and so that referral is very helpful. But in the case of the student, you know, isn't ready for that much support, this helps a, a counselor really take them through what the next step is, which is helpful. It also helps our frontline staff at the financial aid office who are often student employees to really help another student go through, you know, what their next steps would be. Um, and so, again, the idea was to be very clear, very clean, and, and simple. Um, our communication to students had to change. And we have been in the process of really trying to make our communication clear and effective campus-wide. So this really hit, um, hit a goal that we were trying to do anyway, which was nice. Um, and our idea was that we would that we would have um, an email that would be very simple and um, clear, bulleted, short and sweet as, as much as we could, and then also have a printed version with pictures of who they could find in those locations. And so that was another um, another big piece for us because we didn't want to just send them to an office. You know, it's different when you can say, okay, go to the library on the fourth floor. But if they can actually see a picture of someone that they should see when they get to the library, then that's very helpful. Um, and so that communication to our students has to be by email at our campus. That's a, that's a policy for us. We like to do email and we don't have a lot of other ways to, to track how we communicate with students. That's changing very quickly now in our new environment that we're in now. Um, but we can um, go to the next slide and see that we have really tried to say, you know, right up front, you've been awarded a grant. Um, this is how you pick it up. This is how you receive it. And um, this is what made you eligible. And then also, where can you find more support should you be looking for something um, a little bit more than just financial aid? And we didn't want to just stick to academics. We also tried to include our student engagement centers that are on campus. Our students tend to be very, um, very active in those spaces. And so we wanted to make sure that new students coming into campus that aren't familiar know that they're there and that they, they have the option to go to our student engagement centers to find even more support than, you know, above and beyond just academics, which is really important to us. And so um, our idea for the clear communication, like I said, this would go out in an email and then the very next time that they would, um, that they would meet with us about their Chafee grant to actually pick it up, they would receive a printed version of all of these items that are bulleted with a picture of someone who could help them once they get to that location. So. Hey, thank you so much, Brittany, for being here and to share kind of, um, you know, being so, being able to share um, kind of what your guidance process is. I think that's great. I love that flow chart. I think it's awesome. Thanks. Right. Um, and so I did want to mention that there um, in the chat, I had shared earlier that there was a link that you can go to to download the toolkit, including the templates that we had shared um, already. Um, and in the chat right now, if you look in the chat, there is a direct link that Debbie Rauscher has actually already put into the chat box. You can click on that link and go to that live link um, as we speak. Um, within the SB150 toolkit, if you haven't had a chance to download it and look at it, um, we have the implementation recommendations that are uh, much more robust than the ones that I had actually shared today. I shared a, a very small snippet of ones, the ones that are in there. Um, the, the legislative language is also in there. If you um, need to review what the actual legislative language is, the sample forms are in there. Um, and then as well as a very detailed FAQ that um, I just wanted to also shout out to um, CSAC who really helped us 
um, to curate the FAQ um, and to vet the FAQ as well. So thank you so much to Santiago and to um, Ramona as well over at CSAC. Again, there's a website there um, as well for you if you would like. And again, that, that link is also in the chat box. Um, there is technical assistance available for institutions that are um, you know, maybe you are looking at watching this presentation, you're wondering, wow, we are not as far as Sierra College, or we are almost there, or we need support. Um, and so JB is actually going to be providing that for everyone um, <clears throat> as well. Um, so if you can have um, technical assistance that can have customized policies, um, we can sit down with you and figure out um, what are the current policies and how do you um, how, how can you fit these new provisions into what is happening on campus? Um, we can help to train staff um, and to maybe review the forms. It's really going to be what um, the, the, it's going to be what the institution needs. And okay? so if you are actually interested in providing that um, and getting that, it's open to um, um, staff members at colleges and universities. Um, it's for, then there's the tiny URL, there's a tiny URL in there that you can go to um, and I believe if, um, we might, we'll also put that in the chat box for you as well, if you are at an institution. Um, and we're also gonna be sending this out as an email um, in the follow-up email as well. Okay, and so at this point, this is where we are at our Q&A section. I did want to also um, emphasize, um, Santiago has reminded me to um, mention that the appeals form should not be going to CSAC. The appeals form um, that you have created um, and that you are doing with students if you're at an institution needs to go to the individual institution. So you're not sending those forms over to CSAC. Okay, so if you have any questions, go ahead and put, type those questions and then um, click send. It'll send it over to us and then we will be answering questions. Um, we have Debbie Rauscher here that was going to help us to moderate this. Debbie, are you still on? Yep, I'm here, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, all right, so I will just jump into the question. So the first one is for Santiago, uh, and the question is, do undocumented students qualify for the Chafee Grant? Santiago, I'm not sure if you might be muted. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, can hear you now. Okay, so that's a great question. So uh, undocumented students can be eligible for the uh, Chafee Foster Youth Grant. They need to complete the DREAM Act application first. And then once they have their DREAMer ID number, they'll actually do that to complete the Chafee application. So we there's links on, our, on the Chafee website as well to the DREAM Act application as well as on our uh, CSAC website. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question I'm going to direct to you, Tia. Um, the question is, for the student success plan, is this something that an external advocate, in other words, somebody, say, working for a nonprofit organization that's providing support to college students, is that something that they can put together, or does it have to be a college or university staff person? That's a great question. Um, I think, uh, no, I think I know. So the college university staff person needs to be involved. So if there is a program that the student is working with as an external, maybe there's a social worker or a um, transitional housing program, um, then the staff person can connect them to that program. Um, and then making just make sure that the staff member is signing off on that form to financial aid. Um, I think that's the best way. I think that involving someone that's already in the youth life makes sense. Um, so just making sure that there is involvement with the campus support, uh, with the campus staff member. Great. Um, so the next question is for Brittany, um, and it's a clarification about the Chafee reinstatement petition. So the question, the way the question was framed was, uh, does the reinstatement petition and the student success template get completed at the same time, or do those happen at different times? But I think that the reinstatement petition is actually used um, at the appeal stage rather than when a student success plan would be created. So do you want to just sort of clarify how those things fit together? 
Yeah, I absolutely can. So the, um, the student success plan and the education plan, those are created alongside of this reinstatement petition. So part of our reinstatement process is to have an updated education plan and success plan. And the reinstatement form is really just the driver of that conversation. And those things would be attached. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to answer the next question, which is, is the webinar being recorded and can it be emailed to you? The answer to that is yes. The webinar is being recorded. Everybody who uh, is on the webinar today will get a follow-up email uh, with the recording. I also had uh, one person say they couldn't access the link through the um, chat. So that will also be emailed out to everybody uh, after the webinar. So don't worry if for some reason you can't access that. Um, so I'm going to put this next question to you, Tia. Um, the question is, since SB 150 already went into effect this spring semester, and the majority of the foster youth students have already received their Chafee check without receiving the initial communication about services that are available and the new uh, SAP standards, uh, they're worried that they're behind in providing this communication. When would you recommend that students receive this information? Go ahead and wait until they get their next check, um, which might not be until next fall, or go ahead and send it out now before the semester ends. Um, that's a great question. I, I think that especially in this given you know, COVID-19, to send it out as soon as possible, I think that sending it with their next check may actually be, it could be too late. Um, and so now, probably more than ever, they need to have um, some resources they can fall back on. And now that we are all remote, how to access those resources. Um, so sending it as soon as possible um, could be good, um, could be great. Um, it may not be perfect. Uh, it may need to have some iterations and some changes and some updates, um, especially when we're back on campus, but sending it as soon as possible um, could be helpful for students. Great. Um, so the next question I'm also gonna put to you, Tia. Uh, the question is, if a current student did not meet SAP for 2018-19, so the last school year, but they're still enrolled for 1920, um, and they were disqualified from financial aid because they didn't meet SAP in the previous year, are they now eligible to receive a Chafee grant for 1920, or do they need to appeal? Um, so if they didn't make it within the last academic year that's one year of not making SAP, then they would need to meet with a staff member to create a plan so they can have their staff reinstated, or so they have their TP um, grant reinstated. So, right. Yeah. So, yeah, they would, they would, you know, I want to distinguish for folks the difference between having to create a plan and having to actually appeal. And so in this case, the student didn't meet SAP for one year, they're still enrolled, so they haven't met that two year threshold of losing eligibility, they do have to create a plan because they didn't meet SAP for one year. Um, but once that plan is created, eligibility gets automatically reinstated. They don't need to go through an appeals process or provide any uh, justification or extenuating circumstances for why they didn't make SAP. Um, the next question I'm going to direct to Santiago. Uh, the question is, can a Chafee grant be used for an out-of-state school? Yes, a Chafee grant can be used for an out-of-state school if the student is a California foster youth. So they have to have a California connection. So they could be a foster youth in another state coming to a California school or a California foster youth that's going to an out-of-state school. They still need to meet, uh, the, the out-of-state school still needs to meet uh, the criteria of having um, a graduation rate of 30% or higher or, and also, and also have a, a a cohort default rate of 15.5 or less. So there are some um, requirements in order for the out-of-state school to be eligible. And through our um, web grants for students, that's why it's really important for students to create the web grants for students account, because they can actually um, list the school that, that they want to attend that's out-of-state. We'll, we'll get that email from them, that communication. We'll go ahead and do the research, double check if the school is eligible. If they are, we go through the process of adding them to the drop-down list so the student can select it down the road. And then and that's usually a um, two to three week process. Great. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and answer the next question. So the question is, 
If I am understanding, a foster youth can receive a Chafee check for two consecutive semesters of not meeting SAP, and then two more semesters of not meeting SAP with a plan in place. Is that correct? The answer is yes. That is right. You have captured it beautifully. Um, the next question I'm going to direct to Brittany. Um, so the question is, well, the question is, how long does the Chafee appeal process usually take? I don't know if you've uh, actually, you know, I know you've created the form. I don't know if you've had somebody go through the appeals process or not. Um, but if you can speak to sort of how long that has taken or how long you anticipate it would take. Yeah, so um, usually our, our normal appeal process um, before all the foster use petitions were moved um, for me to be able to review is about four to six weeks. Our target for our foster youth is to have any petition or appeals that are submitted to be within two weeks. So um, that's our goal. And But like you said, we haven't had anyone reach this, this part of the process yet. Um, so that would be our goal though, is to do this within about two weeks um, if they had to submit it. Uh, the next question I am going to put to you, Tia. Um, so the question is, uh, for school with an existing appeals process for students not making SAP, does the two-year receipt of the Chafee begin after the school's appeals process is over or when they initially did not meet the SAP requirement? And it says, for example, SF State allows students to appeal and have one year uh, to continue to receive financial aid to bring up their SAP. That's their normal SAP appeals process. So does the two-year receipt, Chafee, begin after uh, that period or when, from when they initially did not meet the SAP requirement? I don't think I'm understanding the question fully. Can you maybe rephrase? Sure. You know, I'll go ahead. I know it's a little confusing if you're not reading it. Um, so let me, I'll just go ahead and answer it. The, the answer to the question is, uh, the two-year receipt timeline um, begins from the point that they initially don't meet SAP. It's really kind of exists now separate from whatever existing appeals process your campus might have for other forms of financial aid. So let's say a student starts in the fall of 2019 and they don't make SAP for that first fall semester and then they don't make SAP again for the spring of 2020. They come back to school fall of 2020. They do a plan for how they're going to improve progress. They don't make SAP. And then they're there for the next spring. And they update their plan, but they still aren't making SAP. So now four semesters have gone by. That's when they lose eligibility for the Chafee grant. There may be another process going on alongside it for their other financial aid. So they didn't make SAP in fall of 2019 and then they didn't make SAP again in spring of 2020. That's when they lost eligibility for Pell Grant, Cal Grant, other things. Maybe they appealed at that point. Maybe they got their financial aid reinstated, or maybe they didn't. That's kind of happening um, alongside and separate from this two-year timeline uh, that exists for Chafee. So it sort of doesn't matter what's happening with their other financial aid um, in terms of informing this process. Um, the next question, uh, Tia, does, does SB 150 uh, apply for returning students who are coming in in 2019-2020 academic year, or does it only apply for a returning student who would start in fall of 2020? Um, it would be for the 2019-2020 year. Um, the <clears throat> law was um, reinstated and act was active um, January 1st, 2020. So it would be relevant for students in this year. Right. Okay. So spring of 2020 is kind of the first term um, that the new rules would apply. Yes. Thank you for that. Um, so the next question. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and take, um, there's kind of a couple of questions about uh, if a student is over 26, is there anything available for older students and any chance that the age limit is going to be removed for the Chafee grant? Um, so 
you know, in terms of the age limit, I would say it's it's very unlikely that that's going to change. You know, it did just change uh, very recently. It went up from 22 to 26. Um, so that was great uh, that we saw that increase. The age limit is set by federal law, not state law. And so it's a whole different process to try to um, make any changes to the Chafee Grant Program. So um, especially given the uh, upcoming economic downturn, um, I think it's not very likely that we'll see that change in the near future. Um, and then in terms of what's available for older students, while Chafee Grant isn't available, there are other programs. A lot of the campus-based support programs don't have age limits, and so that's something that can be available in some cases to students. Uh, for the Cal Grant program, I'm not going to get into the details. It's complicated, you know, but depending on whether it's a transfer grant or, um, you know, some of those programs are available uh, to students over 26 as well. The Pell Grant doesn't have an age limit. Um, so those are some of the resources for older students. Okay, the next question. Um, uh, just looking at some of these questions. Um, Santiago, I'm going to put this question to you, and I'm signing it to you so that you can read it directly. Um, but the question is, are there any changes on how Chafee can be used for technical education program? I have heard in the past that if a program is less than one year, a student is not eligible for the Chafee grant. So can you just kind of speak to that? Uh, well, the Chafee grant right now is not just used at like community colleges or UCs or CSUs. They can be used at uh, vocational um, technical colleges right now. Um, some of those programs are a year year and a half or year round. Um, so I'm not sure uh, where they got that information from. It, it can be used. So can, if, somebody go, if somebody goes into a program that's say just a six month CTE program of some sort, can they still receive a Chafee grant if it's less than a year long program? Right, and they may not get the full 5,000 because they have to be enrolled you know, for the whole academic year, what we consider from, you know, from July 1st through the, um, through September 30th. I mean, they have to be enrolled during that time, but if they are um, and they're meeting more than half time and meeting all the other requirements, then they, they'll be eligible for, for a Chafee grant. Okay, great, thank you. Um, the next question, um, I'm gonna go ahead and take a stab at answering this question. Um, it says, when SB 150 went into effect, some professionals may be misunderstood I might have moved forward certifying Chafee students without having them create a plan. Um, what would be the consequences? Does this mean we are not in compliance? Um, and Santiago, maybe you can chime in as well, but I would say that what I would recommend is that you go ahead and just create a plan as soon as possible for any student who uh, did receive a Chafee grant and didn't uh, have that plan done. So just at this point, go ahead and and do it as soon as you can. Um, Santiago, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think you're exactly right. I mean, just, you know, it's kind of new for everybody. So I would just recommend everybody who, if any student that needs a plan that is in that possibly not meeting SAP in the future should should get some information, some help and, and get a plan in place. So you're absolutely right. Okay, and Santiago, you sort of um, mentioned this a minute ago, but if you can just clarify, what is the minimum number of units a student must be enrolled in to receive a Chafee grant? So your school needs to consider them um, being more than half time. So typically that can be more than six units. Um, you know, certain schools have clock hours. So it really varies depending on your school. What do you consider more than half time? Great. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take this next question because it's a little confusing. Um, so rather than try to read it out loud, the question is, uh, if a student is on SAP appeal and they're not meeting SAP standards but continue to be eligible for Pell because they they successfully appealed, uh, would they be eligible for a Chafee based on the federal SAP appeal or do the Chafee SAP rules apply and the student will need to meet and have a Chafee plan as well? So the answer to that question is they need to have that 
uh, academic progress plan. So essentially, kind of the rules that govern the Chafee Grant Program live in a separate place in, term, in terms of statute. Um, to provide a little bit of context for this, although we in California treat this Chafee Program um, like it's a financial aid program and CSEC manages it, the truth is the funding for the program actually comes from the social services budget. It's a social services program that the Department of Social Services contracts with the Student Aid Commission to manage. And this is why the rules for Chafee can be set as different from some of the other financial aid sources because it's actually a social services grant. It's not a financial aid program, technically speaking. And so the, the place that it lives in law now kind of lays out the rules specifically for this program. And so students need to be in compliance with those particular rules, kind of regardless of what might be happening with the rest of their financial aid. So hopefully that's clear. Um, okay, the next question is, uh, I'm gonna put this to you, Tia. Um, if a student takes a leave from school for a year or two, uh, and they were awarded Chafee prior to their leave. Um, when they return to campus, do they need to reapply for the Chafee grant again? Actually, Santiago, now that I'm reading this question, I'm going to actually put this to you. So a student okay. was receiving Chafee, uh, took a leave of absence, re-enrolled. Did they have to reapply for the Chafee grant, or does that automatically get reinstated with their re-enrollment? So the only thing they need to do is make sure they do the current FAFSA. Everything else, for example, the Chafee application is done once. They only have to do it once in a lifetime. That's it. CDS verification is done only once. Once they're verified, they don't have to worry about it anymore. The only thing that gets renewed on a yearly basis is the FAFSA or DREAM Act application. Great. And one more question for you, Santiago. Um, can the grant be used for cosmetology schools? Yes, it can. Um, and then the last question I have here uh, is just kind of a clarification um, that uh, the question is, if students are on academic probation, will they receive the Chafee grant? Um, the answer is, it depends, um, but yes, uh, likely they will. So again, you know, the basic rule is, even if a student's on academic probation, um, which may be impacting their other sources of financial aid, as long as they have not been on uh, have not met that SAP standard for four consecutive semesters or five consecutive quarters, and they've complied with the requirements to do a student success plan if needed, they do receive the Chafee grant, even if being on academic probation is limiting their ability to access uh, other, um, other uh, financial aid sources. Um, Santiago, I'm gonna... Um, assign this question we just got in getting a couple more last minute questions here to you um, but I'll go ahead and read it so it's sort of follow up on what you said previously if a student is enrolling um, to a makeup artistry community education class offered at a community college does she qualify for a Chafee grant she, uh, they contacted the program as it was informed that she will not be receiving financial aid this is a five-week class only, so it's a very short duration uh, course. Is that something that she could qualify for a Chafee grant for? Well, it, it could be if the student is is taking like multiple classes and considered more than half time, she could be um, awarded for that one term only, if that's the only term that she's gonna be going for. Um, so depending on the school, um, a lot of cosmetology schools are what we consider like a four, like a year round four term uh, type of school. So I've seen cases where they just get awarded for one term and then they, the student maybe, you know, doesn't, doesn't go anymore or completes their program. Um, but that is, that is possible to get awarded for just one period of time for that five week time. If the student's going more than half time meeting all the other requirements. Right. Uh, you know, I mean, I think the best advice is that if you have sort of a unique situation like that, reach out to CSAC um, and they can help clarify the particulars. And Debbie, they can um, always email us um, real quick at chafee at csac.ca.gov. 
um, you know, we have analysts that, you know, watch that uh, inbox all day so we can answer any questions there as well. Um, so more than happy to help out. Great. Um, all right. So I think that's it for uh, the questions. Um, oh, one more just popped up um, for Santiago. If a student drops out, uh, in the middle of the term, do they have to pay the Chafee grant back? Uh, no, we won't. We'll go back to try to recoup that money. Okay, great. Um, all right, I think that's it for the Q&A. So I'm going to turn it back to you, Tia, uh, to close us out. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you for all those um, really great questions, everyone. Um, I know that this is a new program that everyone is still learning. Um, so thank you um, to our participants and to, of course, our panelists, Brittany and um, to Santiago. And of course, Debbie, thank you so much for moderating that Q&A. Um, so if you have any questions, you can reach out to me, um, tia at jbay.org. Um, you can also reach out to Debbie if you have specific policy questions in regards to the Chafee Grant as well. Hers is Debbie, D-E-B-B-I-E -E at jbay.org. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. And um, again, this is being recorded and will be sent as a follow-up email within 24 hours. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.